Thank you, Debbie, and, and thank you for having us uh, present on this important topic. Uh, we have been very fortunate over the years to receive that generous support from CCAT uh, in a bid to improve our understanding of who will opt to use autonomous vehicles in the future and how many will shift from transit to shared autonomous vehicles and uh, with a goal to inform uh, policy and planning. Uh, of particular interest is to understand how this technology would impact transportation disadvantaged populations and guide policymakers on preparing uh, location based interventions that can guarantee equitable access to uh, this technology. So my student Lisa that will introduce uh, in a moment will provide an overview of our research findings to date uh, for two metropolitan statistical areas in, in the Midwest, Chicago and Indianapolis. Uh, we have received uh, another year of support from CCAD where we're examining whether also the surrounding built environment has any influence on the levels of technology adoption and whether changes in built environment could result in a reduction in active travel and physical activity. And as you can understand, this would probably be not a positive um, outcome of this technology. So we want to make sure we have the right information and tools so we can help planners to prioritize strategies, make sure we increase the wide use of these technologies while motivating an increase in active uh, travel behavior. Uh, so Lisa is currently a PhD candidate at the Lai School of Civil Engineering. Uh, she has been my advisee uh, for several years now. Uh, she has obtained her bachelor's degree in civil engineering at the National University of Columbia in Bogota, and she received her master's in civil engineering from Purdue, uh, looking at a first and last mile solutions for intercity uh, passenger rail. Uh, she has been awarded a number of awards, such as the IT, Edward Cox Memorial Transportation Scholarship, uh, the Maggie Walls Leadership Legacy Scholarship from the Women's in Transportation Seminar, uh, several awards within um, the School of Civil Engineering, most notably uh, the Eldon Yoder Memorial Award and a Bisland uh, Dissertation Fellowship. Um, so uh, Lisa is planning to pursue an, uh, uh, an, an academic career and uh, her research interests include transportation planning, accessibility, active travel and public health, rural transit and sustainability. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so today uh, we will talk uh, about a project that we work for a year or more uh, to try to understand the public acceptance of social um, of different socioeconomic levels in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles and try to see what implications this has for planning. So to start with um, the what motivated this study, I want to start with some uh, trends. So in 2017, in the States, there were 270 million vehicles uh, registered and around 40 miles traveled per, um, per person. But this trend has been slightly going down since 2006 because the annual vehicles might have been decreasing. And in some literature, this has been, uh, this has been, said that is due to the behavior of millennials, which are um, 73 million in the States right now. So millennials have, have a different behavior that most of the population because they are the driving less than their same cohort previous years. But not only millennials will occupy the US territory in the future, but we also see that there might be an increase of older population, older than 65 by 77%. And also uh, we might be expecting an increase uh, in income inequality. For those reasons, uh, we believe that studying who uh, share autonomous vehicles might provide the mobility for some of these disadvantaged groups um, and probably complement the use of public transit. So as Dr. Gritza mentioned, um, SAVs are emerging in mainly in urban areas. Um, and this, the case study uh, of this research is to 
uh, metropolitan statistical areas in the Midwest. But most of the research in AVIS has been focused on the impact that this has on safety and the environment and, trans and the land use. Uh, but some fewer research has been focused on the equity impacts or economic impacts and also the health impacts of this technology. So we believe that understanding the characteristics of the distinct market segments could help us to get a tr smoother transition to this technology. That was the main motivation of this research. So to, as a case study, we decided two cities in the Midwest and the main idea between these two cities or the main reason why we choose them is because they have a very different transportation system and how people use the transportation that is available to them is very distinct. For instance, Indianapolis commuters drive alone, 86% of them drive alone to work, while only 1.9% of them use public transportation. This is not the case of Chicago. The corresponding mode shares of Chicago are 49.5% 49, 49 of people who drive alone and 28.3% of people who drive, uh, who goes to work by public transportation. Other different characteristics of between the two cities is that 23% of Chicago residents commute less than five minutes to work in comparison with 6.1 in Indianapolis. Chicago is also four times more dense than Indianapolis and it has a higher um, transit coverage uh, by 79% transit is Chicago is covered by transit. Based on 2017 National Travel Household Survey, 43% um, of Chicago respondents mentioned that they have used ride sharing services the year previous to the survey, but only 23%, of respondents in Indianapolis said that they have used this, this kind of systems. Uh, we have also complete uh, research in our group uh, looking specifically at the first and last mile options for these two cities, and we noticed great difference between the two. So that was our motivation to choose these two settings to study. The research objective of this um, study was assess the public acceptance of AVs across the two study areas with different densities and travel characteristics, as I just pointed out in the previous slide, by identifying the market segments with different characteristics and levels of adoption of the population. We also try to identify the transportation disadvantage areas within these two cities. And with that, we're trying to join these two analyses and provide the best strategies and suggestions uh, to those areas in order to ensure that there will be a smooth transition to AVs and ACVs in the future. So in this slide, I am presenting the research framework that we, we use for the study. So we are trying to make it in the form of something that could be replicable in other area of study. So the first thing that we did was conduct a behavioral experiment and we tried to gather a representative sample from both Chicago and Indianapolis. From that sample, we, we gather information in terms of the intention to switch from public transportation to SAVs and also we did a market segmentation analysis. Uh, complementing that information with uh, secondary data, and mainly data from the census and NHTS. We did a spatial multi-perspective approach, and we looked there mainly three measures of um, access, which were accessibility, mobility, and outcome-based measures. And I will explain them a little bit later in the presentation. And from that, we could see where the transportation disadvantaged population were located in both Chicago and Indianapolis. After that, we joined these two um, analyses and we conduct a spatial market segmentation analysis. Uh, later, we compare across the study areas and we propose some policy and planning implications for both settings. So as I mentioned, one of the 
the, the data that we use uh, for the study was a survey. We designed a survey that was distributed to both areas. And it was distributed online by using Quadrix. We gathered 400 responses from each um, metropolitan area. And we tried to make the sample representative in terms of age and gender, imposing hard quotas to, to the data. And because this is a human uh, subject research, we had the approve of the IRB with the protocols that are there. Uh, there was a slightly different uh, time for the data collection. So in Chicago, we collected the data in November, 2017. And for Indianapolis, it were, was around March, 2018. So the survey that we distributed had mainly five sections. The first section uh, had questions regarding people awareness towards AV. So whether people was aware that Tesla existed um, or Waymo existed, uh, things like that. Then in section two, we have questions about people travel characteristics. In this section, we have a mini, like a mini travel diary where we ask uh, people regarding the different purpose of the travel, which is the mode that they use, how frequent they use this mode. In section three, we ask um, in terms of factors affecting people's behavioral intention to rights in AVs. And this actually built onto a previous um, CCAT project that we developed for, for the center. Um, and in this project, we identify different factors such as perceived behavioral control or attitudes to use the technology that will influence uh, the behavioral intention to write an AV. So this session was mainly uh, asking about these different factors. Then section four, for section four, we have some multiple experiment. Uh, and actually this section was using one of the, of the, of the objectives of this project. Then the final section was social demographic questions, general social demographic questions. In the last session, we were able to ask respondents for their zip code, which allowed us to do the spatial um, analysis that is going to be presented in this project. So the survey sample uh, for the two cities, so I mentioned that we make it representative in terms of gender and the ratios that were comparable to the sample were the American Community Survey for 2017, which was the latest available data at the time we conducted the survey. And we have uh, different model splits from between Chicago and Indianapolis, where Chicago, you can see 12% of people will uh, either walk, but the percentage was fewer in Indianapolis in Indianapolis, again, 81% of people mainly use um, cars compared to 65% in Chicago. After we have gathered the data, we move on to developing the market segmentation analysis. And for this, again, we try to use the, the questions uh, for section three, which were the factors affecting the behavioral intention to use autonomous vehicles in the future. So we did a cluster analysis grouping cases similar to each other and addresses, addressing heterogeneity in the data. We classified the respondents into distinct market segments and they, the method that we used was the K-means algorithm. And the reason to use that method was that our um, data was ordered. So for these questions, we use a Likert scale uh, of five points uh, on whether people will agree or disagree that, for example, autonomous vehicles will be suitable for them or that they have safety concerns in terms of autonomous vehicles. And these questions were um, input into the cluster analysis and allow us to have uh, the different market segments. So at the end, we use the five uh, categories of the Roger um, diffusion of innovation theory to 
to label our five density groups. So we use the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggers for our five density market segments. So if, if you may have seen the, the curve of adoption from the diffusion of innovation is more or less a normal uh, curve, a shape curve. So we obtained a similar result for our respondents. And we found that for Indianapolis, the percentage of people who will be in the first category of innovation, such as innovators and early adopters were fewer than the ones for Chicago. For the early majority, it was around the same, but then for uh, people who will take some time to adopt the technology, which will be classifying the late majority and laggards, had a higher percentage in Indianapolis than in Chicago. Uh, once we obtain these different market segments using the factors affecting the behavioral intention to use autonomous vehicles, we classify them uh, or we try to see what are the social demographic characteristics that were um, the main in each of the different uh, levels. So for example, we found characteristics in terms of gender. Innovators were mainly uh, male in Chicago. And we also found uh, some difference in terms of the commuter trips. For instance, in Chicago, we found that people who use public transit were, was most likely to be classified as innovator. We found the same for people younger than 34 years old. But if you go to the other extreme, we could, we could found that people who use their car were more, were more likely to be classified as laggards and older people also were more um, likely to be classified as laggards for Chicago. For Indianapolis, we found a similar picture. Uh, so we found that innovators were, uh, were mostly male uh, that use either public transit or walk and that were younger than 34 years old. In terms of laggards, we also found that some percentage of female, a lar some large percentage of female was part of the lagger groups and also people who really rely on their cars and that is uh, in the older uh, spectrum of the population. After we have uh, the market segmentation analysis in these five distinct uh, level of adoption categories, we move into the intention to switch for, from public transit. As I mentioned for this, we use the uh, more choice experiments in trying to see what are people will likely to use or replace public transit by using an SAV in the future, in the near future or in the foreseeable future to try to um, estimate the short and long uh, run of these changes. So we assess the public acceptance and intention to switch from public transportation to SAVs in both the short and long run. And for that, we use bivariate order profit models um, to estimate the likelihood of an individual switching from public transportation to SAVs. Uh, we model these responses as a system for each of the cities due to the high correlation between the two responses from the long and the short and the long run. Um, since we use some of those factors that I was talking about in the previous analysis, some of those factors like uh, whether I think uh, AV is, uh, is safe or not, we have potent potential uh, endogenous variables there. Uh, but to correct for that, we use binary probit models and we use the probabilities of those resulting models in the final model in the bivariate order probit. Um, so this is just the descriptive statistics for Chicago. So as you can see, 30% uh, of our sample were either near uh, neutral to switch from public transit or to SAVs in the near future. 
in, in the foreseeable future, uh, but we have some percentage of people who was uh, very likely, but also as you can see, the two responses seems to be highly correlated and they were uh, the same uh, was for Indianapolis. Um, close to 30% uh, of respondents said that they were neutral in terms of switching from public transit to SAVs in the near future and for CRL future. But again, the questions were, uh, seems to be correlated and we modeled them as a system for each city. So in terms of the results, we found that things that were positively associated with shifting from public transit to SAVs were uh, in, in, in the two terms, like in the short term and the long term, where the awareness, uh, positive perceptions, opinions, and attitudes towards this new technology were also important to make the switch. Uh, people who think reliability and flexibility are important factors in their mode choice decisions also will switch uh, from public transit to SAVs. Uh, and we found that younger respondents were more likely to switch in the short term, uh, but in the long term, we also found students as to be likely to switch. Uh, what will make person not likely to switch were mainly concerns in terms of safety, uh, whether the person thought safety was an important uh, factor to choose their mode of travel, and also whether safety or whether they thought safety, uh, they have safety concerns in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles technology. And that was for Chicago. For Indianapolis, we found some similar results and some um, different results as well. So in terms of uh, short-term intention, we again found high awareness and positive perception and opinions. But we also found that in Indianapolis, people who was uh, earning less than $50,000 uh, um, as an annual income will likely to change uh, from public transit to SAVs in both the short and long term. A again, for the characteristics that will not make you likely to change will be your uh, concern in terms of safety for AVs and also whether travel safety was an important factor for you to consider when you are choosing your mode of travel. Um, after we had known where, where those uh, characteristics of people who were likely to change and also we known the market segment, we move into identifying the transportation disadvantaged areas. And for this, we use a multispatial perspective approach composed of three measures. The first one was accessibility. And in this one, we mainly were uh, trying to evaluate what opportunities were close to the area when a person lives. Uh, then we look at the mobility. And in this, we looked at what are the demographics of the area. And then we looked at the outcome measures, which were how much does a person in a certain area will need to drive daily. And I will go into detail for each of those uh, measures. So for accessibility approach here, I am presenting the results uh, or the, the objectives that we have for Indianapolis. So we look to the opportunities that were close to an area. And I have to mention that the unit of analysis for this, uh, um, for this was census block groups in the um, metropolitan statistical area of Indianapolis. So if a large hospital, school, recreational facilities, museum, public libraries, and in the case of Indianapolis, public stops will be close to an area, an area will uh, be classified as to be a uh, highly accessible. If they were close, especially in terms of walking, transit, of, or driving. If they were only close in terms of driving or taking transit, they will be classified as a median accessibility area. And then if they were close only by driving, we will uh, say this area has a low accessibility level. 
In terms of the mobility-based approach, uh, we took two things into consideration. The first one was the age and psychological factors. So, so here we look at whether a person was older than 65, which will make him or her to have mobility, uh, reduce mobility, or whether a person was disabled or whether uh, there was a highly percentage of population who was younger than 14 years old, but also uh, might need a, a special accommodation for traveling. We also look at the probability of lack of mobility choices. And here we took into account the percentage of population of people that was uh, unemployed or was not in the labor force or people who didn't own a car and also a uh, percentage of population who will be one uh, single house, one person in the household older than 18 that is working but also has a child uh, in the household. So those were the characteristics of people who had high probability of lack of mobility choices. And this was based uh, mainly, the choice of these characteristics was based mainly in literature review uh, of disadvantaged areas. So for the outcome-based approach, we use NHTS and we use the, a product of NHTS called the locals, local area transportation characteristics. And we looked uh, for each of the cities, was, what was the mean of that transportation characteristics? So to, to see what is the passenger miles for each of the census block groups and what will make a census block group to have less or more, to have to drive less or more. So since the two settings that we were looking at were very distinct, we choose uh, a characteristic for each. So for example, for Indianapolis, the, the rule is that a household will be composed by two people and have two uh, cars, but this was not the same for Chicago. So for Chicago, what we consider was three household and one car to try to address uh, how many passenger miles um, will be needed from a census block group. So here are the results of the multi-spatial perspective approach. So first, um, I will show you for accessibility in Chicago, as one would expect, uh, downtown Chicago was marked to be highly accessible and several of the census block groups, but areas going like to the middle uh, or further away from the downtown will be classified as very low accessibility CVGs. Then in terms of mobility, uh, if we said they have very high uh, mobility needs, uh, we found an area in the south part of Chicago and some areas um, closer to downtown as well. In terms of the outcome base, uh, we found that for the, assuming the three person household only just one automobile, we found that people uh, located or the population or the census block groups located close to the downtown of Chicago will have to drive less to go to where they need to go, whilst people in the south parts and north parts of Chicago will need to drive more to reach um, or make more miles to reach their destination. After we have the three outcome, uh, the three measures, we uh, overlap them and we identify what were the areas that were highly transportation disadvantaged. So in Chicago, we found them to be scattered through the area, but we having, having a high uh, percentage of them in the south uh, part of Chicago. Uh, so here I am presenting the results for the same analysis, but in Indianapolis. And again, Indianapolis, uh, close to the downtown area of the city, we have people that has a high accessibility levels. Uh, but if you compare with the need that they have for transportation, uh, we found it to be very low. Higher needs were uh, found to be towards the ages of the of the county, of Marion County. In terms of the 
of the outcome base, here we were looking at two person household, only two vehicles, and we found that passenger miles uh, of the CVGs located close to the uh, interstates were actually the, the ones who will have to make fewer passenger miles. So again, after uh, overlapping those three uh, analyses, we found that uh, two areas, two highly transportation disadvantaged areas in Indianapolis, one in uh, the south corner, and then the other one in this north part of the city. Um, after having uh, the location of where these disadvantaged groups were, uh, we move on to the exploratory spatial analysis for public acceptance in transportation disadvantaged areas. And since I mentioned in, when I was presenting the survey, we had a uh, location or zip code of the respondents. So the unit of analysis for this um, was for this uh, part of the project was zip code. We did, we consider a uh, univariate analysis and multivariate analysis to different approaches. Uh, and for the univariate spatial uh, analysis, we look at the autocorrelation, exploring Moran's I and GT's ORG. Uh, but we end up um, classifying again our respondents instead of a spatial uh, multivariate cluster analysis. So these are the results of the market segmentation analysis. So as you can see here, the different colors will mean the whether a person is innovator, early adopter, early majority, late majority, or lagger. So some of the transportation disadvantaged areas are also plot there. So we found that where the in Chicago, where the disadvantaged areas were located, mainly. Uh, those zip codes have been classified as laggards or late majority. However, this was not the case of Indianapolis, where we found those areas to be mostly classified as innovators and early adopters, where the disadvantaged population was located. So some of the key takeaways of our study, uh, we found that Chicago seems to be more innovative than Indianapolis about the adoption of SAVs. Mm, some of the characteristics of the late adopters were similar in both cities. Uh, like I mentioned, people who use their cars or were older were more likely to be late adopters of the technology. The intention to switch from public transit to uh, SAVs in the short and the long run were highly correlated in both areas and we modeled them as a system to try to uh, see what, are, what were those characteristics that make a person more likely to switch. One of the characteristics that we found was awareness and we believe that is key in promoting a shift from public transit to SAVs uh, in both the short and the long run in the two areas. However, people who has safety concerns of AVs were associated with a lower likelihood to switch from transit to SAVs. In terms of the analysis for disadvantaged areas, we found that um, in Indianapolis, they were located mainly in the south and east part of the metropolitan area. Well, in Chicago, we saw in the maps that they were scattered through all the Chicago metropolitan area, but a higher percentage was located in the south part of Chicago. Um, we noticed that the areas that were not classified as disadvantaged had a higher access to transit stops and interstates, among other factors. People residing in disadvantaged areas in Indianapolis tend to be early adopters, as we saw for the last analysis that we conducted. This is not the case of Chicago. Uh, people that was disadvantaged in Chicago was mainly located close uh, in zip codes that were classified as late adopters or laggards. Um, the results for the two cities 
were very uh, different and we wanted also to highlight the importance of contextualizing each finding for like we did for each of the analysis looking at what are the characteristics that we really need to consider for each of those analyses that we conducted throughout the study. Some of the policy implications that we could draw from our study uh, were, for instance, some marketing strategies and edu educational campaigns that target location-specific uh, population uh, to bring more awareness about the benefits of autonomous vehicles and mitigate any concerns. So for instance, if we saw at our results in Indianapolis, people who was located in disadvantaged areas might not need as many um, education and marketing strategies as the one as Chicago. So again, it's important to have in mind the context of where you are doing um, these campaigns and educational efforts. Uh, another implication was for urban planners because uh, they should consider uh, the changes in the built environment that provide equitable access to AV services. So as we noticed for some of those disadvantaged areas, more or, most of them were far away from transit stops and interstates reducing their mobility. So changes in the built environment might be a key factor on whether a person can have the access to share autonomous vehicles or, or not, and whether they will truly use it as well. Um, some campaigns, including celebrity endorsement, online contact, and videos about AV's travel experiences can help, can help increase the awareness. And we saw that awareness was a key factor in promoting that shift between public transit users to SAVs users. However, uh, we uh, motivate to the, the policymakers to have strategies to supplement uh, traditional transit services with SAVs such as feeder for the first and last mile that don't make SAVs a competitive mode to transit, but rather a complementing um, a complemented service that enhance public uh, transit attractiveness for the population. Uh, the study comes with few limitations. Uh, one of them is that we conducted uh, a survey at, at one certain point in time. So we did not capture public opinion changes over time, which we believe is worth to study in the future. Um, another limitation is that the analysis or part of the analysis, the first two parts of it, were based on the state preference surveys uh, data that is subject to limitations because the questions are hypothetical in nature, especially the mode choices experiment. Uh, for the for the disadvantaged population uh, analysis, we assume that the census blocks were homogeneous in terms of socioeconomic characteristics. Um, however, if we could uh, be more, um, like if we could have individual data to study these cases, that would be great. But uh, we try to work with the data that was also available in order to make this a tool that could be replicated by other um, by other areas. Uh, we also have been working uh, uh, thanks to CCAD who has provided funding to explore how the built environment around these responses, these respondents influence uh, the public acceptance of AVs. And as Dr. Gritza mentioned in the introduction, we also want to see whether this will pose uh, any harm on health outcomes such as active travel. Um, and I think that's all that I have for today. Uh, I want to, of course, uh, acknowledge the support of uh, CCAT and in providing the, the funding for this study. And I think that's all for me. If any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat box um, or the 
Q and A. Uh, so for the participants, if you have any questions, just type them in there. I have one question to um, start us off. And that's on your last slide, you know, you were talking about how, um, how you can influence the acceptance of AVs based on um, the environment around the respondents residence. And I was hoping that you could kind of give us a little um, some nuggets on this future research that you're doing? Yeah, of course. Uh, we are actually, uh, right now, we have a paper under review about this, this, new, this new part of the project, but uh, what we are trying to do is, for this paper, is we are modeling these five distinct levels of acceptance of AV and trying to identify what are the characteristics that surround these uh, these adopters. Uh, so, for example, whether they have good infrastructure in terms of sidewalks, or they have parks close by, and, and things like that related to the built environment and the structure of the built environment. But we also are looking at whether uh, these respondents are surrounded uh, by areas that have uh, high levels of obesity or diabetes uh, and uh, some other health outcomes that are associated to the likelihood of, or are reduced by the likelihood of walking. So if you walk more, there has been many studies that says you are less likely to get obesity or diabetes. So we are not only looking at the structure of the built environment, but also the characteristics in terms of health outcomes of this built environment of the respondents and trying to see what will make a person that is classified as innovator, uh, what is it surrounded by and why do we need to surround the ones that are not uh, classified as innovators to try to motivate and also make sure that the technology will not have negative implications for the future. I have, I have another question and you know, because this is really about a, a policy, um, what is it going to take to get these policies implemented and how far out do you think that they are? So at least for these two cities that were the case of study for us, and we noticed that Chicago has, since it has a more multimodal uh, behavior, uh, we believe that people will may be more close to adopt the technology once it will be available for them. Although we will need to, uh, as policy makers, we will need to make sure that these groups that are disadvantaged will have enough information and the availability of these services close by to them in order to, to also jump to the services. Uh, and, and in Indianapolis, what our analysis was showing is that we have a higher population that is a lagger to the technology. However, people who was disadvantaged was more willing to jump into this transition. So let's take that for, for that uh, metropolitan area. They might have a longer road for the general population, but the population of interest of this uh, research uh, will be closer to, to make the move and transition into to this technology. I don't know if Dr. Gritza wants to add something there. Thank you, Lisa. And David, that's, that's a good uh, question. Definitely we've seen some changes in policy recently and, and we're hopeful uh, for the next few years. One thing I wanna um, also kind of point out is that uh, connectivity and shared mobility should not be viewed independently of also electrification. And we see a lot of push towards going electrification, just kind of uh, put a plug in for our new center. Uh, you can see that the logo Aspire. So we're looking at more sustainable and equitable transportation electrification and obviously SICAD uh, is a major partner of our center, but we're looking um, into how we can work together with all these different technology solutions to get where we need uh, to go. So we see 
several incentives going on in terms of incentivizing also um, shared mobility drivers and TNCs to convert the vehicles to electric. So that might be also something, um, obviously they will have the connectivity needed and, and potentially going to autonomous. We see a lot of the transit operators willing to work especially because of the pandemic and how they have been hit in terms of their ridership numbers. So they've been starting, um, especially Indianapolis talking to with Indigo, but also other uh, transit providers in the area and also in, in Chicago. So they're trying to figure out a more integrated approach to include those mobility as service as part of also their, their services. So I feel there are a lot of things going on, maybe not as system wide and, and not you know in a holistic way, uh, but I think we're, we're optimistic some of these uh, things will happen sooner than later. Do you think that there's been um, a shift? I know it's kind of early, but between you know the Trump administration and the Biden administration, you know he's all in for, for EVs um, and infrastructure, um, do you think that this is going to sort of accelerate, um, you know, the policies and the work that, that you're doing in your research? Yes, I certainly think so. And, and also, I mean, obviously you're in Michigan, so you, you know about big announcements from, you know, GM and all the other OEMs. So I think the industry is ready and I can talk more on the electrification side because uh, as I said, we have this uh, engineer research center from NSF and we have a substantial industry membership. So they're ready. Uh, they, they're exploring different charging technologies, uh, innovative, traditional. Uh, they really need to cut down the emissions. We have a lot of partners in California too, but that will also propagate to other areas uh, in the US. And, and we are hopeful some of the, the policies will be there. And one specifically we're looking at is um, using some, uh, I think a lot of the DOTs would want to have some of the rest areas being able to be you know, commercially available for charging or other type of, of, of uh, commercial activities. So. Um, okay, I just, I got another, I'm sorry. I, I, I always have a lot of questions. So, you know, something that you said earlier was about, um, you know, we tend to separate CAVs with a, and electrification. And I have to admit that I'm guilty of this. So do you have any advice for, you know, people like me that, that keep those separate, you know, on how we can get those uh, back together and focused and going in one direction. Yeah, I don't know if I have a good advice. I would probably, um, that's something that some lobby, the, the associate director of CICAD all, always uh, tell us to kind of think in that way, both the shared automated and electric vehicles. But definitely I feel there are uh, developments in, in one area that can help the other area. So I think a lot of that is how they can work synergistically. We, we call them more synergistic societies. Uh, so uh, things that are involved in terms of standards, especially because that's uh, something very important, uh, can really drive the other technologies as well. Okay, there is one question uh, in the chat box here. Will autonomous bu bus take off in USA? So I, to be honest, I hope so. Like with all the changes that we are looking and professor is mentioning about electrification in transit i think that we are like transit agencies are moving towards uh, more advanced technologies and certainly i think that that might be one of the things that we will see at the beginning um autonomous buses instead of just like cars and uh, i just hope because that it will be like this because this will also prevent many, uh, it will have more uh, safe, some safety implications as well. And in order to motivate transit and make it more, um, more like uh, good for the people to use it, I think that will be a great uh, start uh, for, the, for the public agencies, for the transit agencies. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, do you guys want to say any closing remarks or would you like me just to wrap up? 
So again, I want to thank thank you, Debbie, and, and the audience, and kind of uh, give maybe another plug. So we're hopefully we're gonna have a secret funded project breaking uh, a lot of the the studies we did on the uh, adoption. Uh, Post pandemic. So, we want to really understand, especially when we talk about shared mobility and shared autonomous vehicles, how has pan the pandemic affected? And we know uh, we've seen how, in terms of sharing, but going back to what would be kind of the new norm, how would that uh, change and how would, feel, uh, would people feel about um, sharing cars, bikes, e scooters, um, and, and then uh, kind of the emerging technologies of AVs? Uh, so hopefully we'll have some to, to report on that at the next meeting. Mm -hmm.